Welcome. One of the questions I get a lot is if you can mix different kinds of clay, earthenware, porcelain, and stoneware. And the short answer is yes, maybe, <laughs> sometimes, but it depends. I mostly throw in stoneware. And I like stoneware for many good reasons. I also do some work in porcelain, but I love stoneware. The only downside with stoneware, depending on what I'm doing, is the color. Because I like this super white color you get from porcelain. But there are just certain things that at least I cannot make. I'm making really white and big uh, bowls, really tall, multi-sectional vases. And well, some people can probably get away with that in porcelain. I'm not one of them. So I like stoneware. But I don't always like the surface. I don't always like the color. So what about using porcelain for that? And also, what about using porcelain as a decorative tool? In this video, I'm going to show you how I get away with this. To mix different kinds of clay, there are different challenges. If we just look at the three main types of clay, earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain, the first issue <laughs> is that they typically fire and, uh, and vitrify at different temperatures. So earthenware, you would usually only fire to 1000, 1100 degrees Celsius, stoneware maybe to 1200, 1250, uh, degrees Celsius, and porcelain up to 1300 or even higher. If you take earthenware and fire it to stoneware or porcelain temperatures, it will melt. It will become a glaze, so to speak. So that doesn't work. <laughs> but what about if you mix them, either you mix them together, and you, you um, wedge them together, or you put them into a plug mill or something, pot mill, um, would that work? Yes. That could actually work. There are clay types you can buy commercially. That is a mix between uh, porcelain and stoneware. Um, they call it mixed clays, or there's different names around, different brand names around the world. But uh, it's actually very nice. I don't buy um, clay like that, but I sometimes mix it because I put all my scraps in a bucket, and then if I have some porcelain, I have some stoneware, it all goes into the same bucket. And that clay is actually super nice. And, and if you are if your stoneware is a little more gray or buffy and the porcelain is super white, then you will get a whiter clay and you will get you know, some of the benefits from both. So that can work. But of course, the firing temperature, the vitrification temperature of, of that clay will of course be different than what each of them were. You could also mix in earthenware, I'm sure. I never done it. <laughs> but I mean, essentially it's all just mud and, and of course it can be mixed. But you have to keep in mind what fire temperature you need for that new mixed clay. And I don't think there's anybody who can tell you that. Um, you have to experiment. I'm not going to go too much into mixing different types of clay in this video. Instead, I'm going to do something that a lot of you have asked me about and that I actually have done a lot of work with. And that is adding porcelain on top of stoneware. Lots of you have asked me, is that possible? Some of you have even claimed, oh no, it's not possible because the shrinkage rate is so different. And that is true. I mean, for most of my stoneware, the total shrinkage is about 10%. And for most of the part, uh, or the, the primary uh, porcelain I use, uh, all three Blackman, the shrinkage is closer to 18, maybe up to 20%. So how can these two work together at all? Well. The first things that I did uh, with uh, adding porcelain to stoneware was uh, a, I think it's a Japanese technique called hakame, um, where you sort of brush on um, uh, strokes of porcelain on stoneware. I do it on, on black stoneware, and I, and I did it on, on some of these cups, um, they're not the most beautiful ones. It's, it's the first <laughs> prototypes I did. So they're glazed inside, they're not glazed on the outside. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a almost black stoneware. Uh, one that I like a lot. Um, and then I brushed this uh, slit made of porcelain. But it was not just porcelain with water. To make sure that it melted out on the pot, um, 
I added a little bit of flux. Uh, I used Costa Feldspar, 15% Costa Feldspar. And uh, I don't know <laughs> if it helped, but at least it didn't, it didn't crack off. It didn't flake. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't look like two completely different uh, uh, types of clay with such a different uh, shrinkage rate. So for this, it worked. It could maybe work for you without adding the flux. And it could, of course, you can use uh, other kind of fluxes than the cost of fields, but, but that's what I used. This is uh, the clay oh, 371 from uh, Jorsen Schneider in Germany that I used uh, for, um, for these cups. This is also the clay I use for my, uh, my plates, most of my plates at least. Uh, and, and the porcelain I'm using is, um, is Audrey Blackman. And, and when you just use that, uh, this is a, a, a pure uh, porcelain pot that I did. And uh, as you see, this is just a clear glaze. It becomes super white. So it's a very strong white. So um, how about using porcelain as, as, as a colorant <laughs> before you add any glazes or before you do pit fire? That is indeed possible too. I have two types of, um, of slip that I made. This is, um, this is the Hakame uh, slip. This is the slip that I, um, I made for, um, for, for these brush strokes where I put in some custom filter. But I also mixed a big bucket because I had a lot of uh, pots recently that I needed to trim in the, in the porcelain. And uh, so I made this pot. And now there's, there's one thing that um, this is like, a little thicker than yogurt, I would say, uh, because I need to be able to apply it also on uh, on vertical uh, and horizontal uh, uh, parts of my pot and don't want it to run off. One thing you may notice is, why is it not white? It looks gray. True, it does. <laughs> and to be honest, I'm actually not 100% sure why it looks so gray. But again, this is the color it gets when it's fired. <laughs> I do believe it could be some oxidation, it could be uh, some molding or something, which will burn away. Some organic things that happen. But essentially, this is just pure uh, uh, porcelain, uh, Arctic Blackman, watered down. The way that I did it is that I had all these uh, uh, cutoffs from uh, trimming uh, my, my pot. I let it dry out. I crushed it up so it was, was small pieces, put it in my bucket, put water in it, and let it soak there for now a few days. And then I took a blender, <laughs> household blender, not the one I use for my food, but one I use for pottery, and I blended it enough to make it like super smooth. It is now like very, very smooth and very nice actually to touch. Very nice. Um, so let's try and see how that works, because this is a new batch. I never used this before. And there's no flux in it. It's pure porcelain and uh, it may not work, but I hope it will. So I will throw a couple of uh, bolts uh, with the black clay and we will add this uh, to the inside to get a, 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 a more smooth and uh, white inside to work with. Let's do that. First, I'm going to do a sort of a shallow bowl in this wonderful black stoneware. It's a seven, well, 371 <laughs> from Joseph Schneider in uh, Germany. It's got 25% grog, but it's a very fine particle, so you can make this surface super smooth. It's just really nice to throw in. So let's go ahead with that. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the actual throwing, so I'm gonna take you quickly through that so you can get to the parcel application. Now that we're getting to this stage, I will just dry it a little bit um, because it is on the soft side. And um, when you do shallow bowls, uh, they can flip over. You probably tried that <laughs> if you ever did that. 
And uh, so um, it has to do with how soft the clay is and how much it can it can sustain, I think it's called. <laughs> if it's too thin, and it is rather thin down here, and uh, there's too much weight up in the top, and there's some weight, um, then um, it just can't hold itself up and it's going to flip over. Um, and they will destroy it, of course. So we don't want that. So um, I'm just going to um, dry a little bit on this lower uh, two thirds. Now it's stiffed up a bit from the heat and uh, I'll just let it spin slowly for well, a little bit, a few minutes, and it will kind of settle and, um, and uh, then I'll be ready to um, do the final uh, shipping. Now I'm back again <clears throat> and uh, it has stiffened up a lot more, so uh, now it's more safe to do the last part of the shaping. As always with a bowl, I'm trying to get a smooth and continuous uh, shape, but I do want this one to be a little wider. Even though it has dried, um, I still need the surface to be um, smooth, but I'm trying not to soak too much water into it, but rather just um, smooth, uh, well, get the surface a little bit of slip, a little bit of water. So, before I do more, I still want it to dry just a little bit more. And, and this is the tricky part because the more wet it is, the more likely it is the porcelain will melt right into it. But uh, also, the wetter it is, the more likely it is it's going to collapse <laughs> when I add it. So I'm going to find the right stage. Also, I got a little bit of a bump here, very, very little, but I would like to trim that out uh, before I add the porcelain. Because, of course, after I add the porcelain, I can't do any more trimming. And to do that, it have to be a little more dry, a little more stiff. So now I'm just going to let it uh, slowly spin. And the reason I spin it um, is that even though there's no air circulation in here, there are no dragging, have no open windows, there's a risk that if you just let it stay in one position, that it will um, it will dry a little bit unevenly. And of course, when that happens, it will it will become uh, uneven, and also if I have to continue doing some drawing or some trimming, if some of it is more dry than other pieces, it will be difficult to make it uh, look good. So um, I'll just let it spin around a little bit and come back in a moment. I just did a little bit of um, smoothing on the inside, and it's now in theory ready for applying the puzzle. I am a bit afraid though that it's still a little bit too soft so when I apply the porcelain it may break down so I will uh, heat up a little bit just on the outside because I still want it to be as soft as possible on the inside um, yeah so we get closer to the same swing as rate. I think it's ready now. So, um, last step in this phase is to apply the porcelain slip. I could pour it on, but I'm just gonna gently spread it out like this with a brush. Some people use their hands, which is also a nice way to do it. Oh, going a little bit fast here. Sometimes you forget with a with a white ball like this that um, the speed goes out the further you get to the edge. Of course.
in case you get a little bit um, of the porcelain uh, down on the other side, um, it's easy enough to remove it. I'm going to trim the outside anyway, so don't worry about that. Now we have an even layer of the porcelain slip. And I know <laughs> it looks a little bit gray, but as I said in the beginning, I think it's due to some molding or oxidation or something. I can see on some of the other parts I already made, made that it dries up completely white, and I'm sure that it will fire white like the porcelain is. So I'm not so worried about that. Now we have uh, it applied. You could let it dry and just fry it that way. You could also let it dry and, and do some graffito, uh, a technique where you basically cut through one layer, cut through the top layer, the white layer, and reveal the other color, the black underneath. You can, can draw some patterns. You can also now, when it's wet, do some, um, some, some patterns with your fingers or tool or something. The good thing about doing it now <laughs> is that if you don't like it, you can just take the brush and uh, and redo the surface. So I think I'm gonna try and do that. If I don't like it, I will just do it again. So I'm just gonna turn it really, really slowly. Oh, something like this and something like that. It's gonna create like a sort of a three-dimensional um, level on it. I'm not sure. I don't actually like this so much. So this is going to be a good opportunity for you to see how, how you can erase this. Because basically, just take your brush. I don't know, maybe I should try something a little bit different here. Um, I think I'm gonna try something like this. I like this better. So, so like this, I'm just going to soften it a little bit. So that's it. And then, um, as I said, I got a little bit of the slip on the outside, but that's fine because I'm going to trim it there anyway. So um, I'm just going to let it dry and um, I'm going to do some trimming on the outside and i um, going to fire it and see how it goes. Of course, uh, to make anything good out of this, I need some sort of an opaque uh, glaze. I have one in mind that works great on both white and, and black uh, clay. So I may want to try that. Um, it's called Waterfall. It's a bluish uh, uh, sort of glaze. But Let's see how that goes um, and uh, see you on the other side when it's all done. Let's do another one with the black clay. This time I'm going to do something that I haven't actually tried exactly in this shape. As usual, I got inspired by other potters like the American Danish potter uh, Tortoise. He does a lot of this. I've done some of this, but not exactly like it. It's basically going to be one of those banded uh, pot where I throw a cylinder, but this time I'm going to add the white uh, puzzling, do some scratching and then expand it and see how that goes.
<laughs> now it's almost getting too high to be in the in the video. I hope it should be much higher than this, maybe a little bit, but I just want to check that it's um, that the thickness of the wall is as even as possible by me. <laughs> Sometimes I use this metal rib because it's so stiff and it, it helps me um, even out the wall a bit without losing height. Now basically just want to scrape it off as much as possible. Um, I want it to be, <laughs> I would say, as dry as possible. That's maybe not the right word because I just, um, I don't want any excess water. Um, I do want to keep this sort of narrow, at least not flaring out. I think it turns out okay, so at least it's um, even walled <laughs> and, um, and relatively straight. Now it's time to apply the slip. To apply I just need the thinnest possible layer um, to cover it. Um, in this case, it's not super important that it's very, very even uh, or smooth um, because I'm going to scratch it up anyway. Also, if there's a little bit of uh, black shining through, I think it's also it's also going to be okay. So um, just I'm all trying to create a sort of a, a contrasty um, texture between the white and the um, and the black, so the white porcelain in contrast to the black clay underneath it. Before I do my scratching, I do want to dry it up just a little bit. Not too much because I need to expand the pot on the inside, so um, just a little bit. Now I'm just going to let it settle for a few minutes, maybe get a cup of coffee or something and then get back to uh, the scratching and expanding. So now I'm ready to um, scratch it. <laughs> and uh, for that, you can use all kinds of tools to scratch. I like using forks. They're very nice and even. And um, I was just looking at my different forks. And one thing you have to try and get is a fork that is flat. Some forks have like a shape and it won't fit your pot. And uh, I was looking for the one that where the spikes had were closest together, and this one is a little bit closer than the other one. So I'm going to take this. Now, basically, I will hold um, onto this a little bit, um, not to um, get it out of uh, shape too much. And then I'll just go from bottom to top. I will probably leave a uh, bit of the top on uh, scratched, but um, it's easy enough to remove in the end, because I'm not going to go so deep. So I'm just getting a good grip of it. Yeah, something like this. So, that's it. And now for the difficult part, <laughs> because I want to um, expand it and I want to have sort of a roundish uh, body. And one of the mistakes that I often made in the past is that I started rounding down here. And the problem with that is that you very often get a heavy bottom in it and it kind of collapse. Uh, so instead I'm going to do what, what actually in, in a way seems unnatural, <laughs> is to start from the top. Um, and uh, I have to say, I haven't always been <laughs> successful with this. So, um, so let's see how it goes. 
Also, by starting with the top and not the bottom, it, I mean, if you start at the bottom, you're also going to weak it because when you expand, you're going to make the clay thinner. And that, of course, is going to weaken the, the, the pot. So um, by starting in the top, there's a chance that um, we'll get away with it. So far it's going okay. I'm going to use a rib and it's going to apply a little more of an even uh, pressure. There's a couple of challenges with this technique. <laughs> One of them, of course, is that you can't um, you can't make it any smaller. You can only expand. So um, that's one of the issues. <laughs> and uh, the other one is that there's a limit to how much you can expand before you break through the wall. And um, of course, you have to stop before that. I just want to make sure that the top doesn't expand too much. So yeah, another thing is, you know, I've seen potters do this really, really fast. <laughs> it's amazing, but um, it's, I feel a little more safe doing it just slowly and um, giving the clay some time to, um, to work. Beginning slowly to look like something. I still think it needs a little bit more shoulders. Yeah, maybe the shoulders should be a little bit higher. The good thing about this design is that even if some of the Puzzling kind of cracks off. It, it will still be beautiful because it's so textured. The, the challenge here is that because I scratched into the clay, there's some uh, lower parts and upper parts. And the lower parts, there's a limit to how much I can stretch it because, of course, at some point I'm going to break through. And um, it's always difficult to judge that, but um, I think I'm getting dangerously close. Would like the shoulder to be a little bit higher. Yeah, I think that got better. Um, just a little bit more. Another good trick is to, I mean, it's very logical to look here, but that won't help you much. You should actually look at the edge because that's where you see the, the curve and the shape of your pot. And then for larger pots, it's always a good idea to walk away a little bit. Now I have the mirror <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the camera here. So I think also <laughs> the thing is you got to stop before it's too late. So um, I think I'm going to stop actually with the shaping. Now I just need to uh, perfect the rim. I think that's it. I will uh, trim um, the foot a little bit. I can do some of it now just to illustrate. I think that's it. And I think it actually turned out okay. I would have liked it to be even more uh, round, but um, there wasn't enough clay for that. <laughs> I had need to um, make the walls even thicker. It's always difficult um, to predict. So um, just gonna take out any remaining moist at the bottom. Um, and that's it. I hope you enjoyed that one. I did, it was actually quite fun. I'm just gonna let it dry and um, cut it loose from um, the bed. And um, then I'm most likely gonna uh, trim the food a little bit. So. Um, I hope it goes well in the firing too.
Now I'm going to try and uh, make a sink. I've done a couple of sinks in a different clay, but this time I'm going to use this uh, dark clay. I'm going to lay a put a layer of uh, of porcelain on the inside only, I think, and keep the dark clay on the outside. See how that turns out. It is a very high rock clay, so it should be stable enough for this very white uh, bowl shape uh, sink. But I've never done it with this clay, so I'll be the first time. <laughs> And that's about, I don't know, seven, eight kilos or something. It needs a pretty thick wall for the clay. So uh, that's so perfect for me because I'm not so good at throwing anything. <laughs> when you're centering, big uh, lump of clay like this. Don't be afraid of um, of the complete size of it. Um, send it in, in, in pieces, in, the, in sections. Uh, don't try and send everything at once. You may notice I started centering the top and then I, I pushed it down the sides and to even it out. And then that way, it's not as hard as one would think. So it's almost centered. That didn't take so long. I just need it to be a little wider, which requires some strength because I need a bigger base for this sort of um, vessel. So now we have a basic centered piece of clay. If I sound a little bit out of breath, then it's because I am. <laughs> it's not extremely bad to do. Big lumps of clay. I've done much bigger than this, but you do need a little bit of strength. So thanks God I'm so strong. <laughs> and as always, when you do really big um, pots, even bigger than this, it's important that things are even more centered than when you do a small one. It's always important, but bigger ones tend to, because this one is going very wide. It's going out to maybe this size. And so, um, It'll be very wobbly if I start up with something that's not properly centered. So um, I'm going to try and see if I can push it down with the palm of my hand. That's usually the best technique for, for these white bowls or sinks. It's not always possible, it depends a little bit on how stiff the clay is. The good thing about pushing it down this way is that you, um, at the same time as you are opening up the clay ball, you're also doing a lot of compression. And, um, and especially for sink, there's a lot of uh, stress on the drainage. When you, when you tighten that, you, um, you sure want it to be very compressed. But I think I need to use my fingers for the last part. You see, I use a lot of water now because there's a lot of clay that needs to be moved. But the second that I'm done moving it, I will, I will take out that lake of water that I <laughs> have in here. Because otherwise it's gonna weaken the clay too much. And um, expanding um, uh, a lot of clay like this, it's almost impossible if you try and move it all at once. So I'm moving my finger under it and then up, and then under and up. And um, that way I'm not, I'm not actually moving that much clay at a time. It makes it much more manageable. And for this, uh, it's a sink. Um, I want a pretty thick bottom because again, I'm gonna tighten this drainage to it. And if it's too thin, I'm afraid it will crack simply. So, um, well, this is still <laughs> too much. It's almost two centimeters or something. So I'm gonna try and take out about half a centimeter or something. I have no rush with this. I wanna make sure that um, I have the best possible starting point when I'm doing this. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on, um, on shaving the, the button and um, 
also on, on the sink I want a continuous uh, flow into the center so that I'm sure that the water will um, run out and not stop on the way anything so now I will push it in a little bit the different ways you can make these uh, shallow bowls which essentially a sink is uh, some potters throw them out in the shape that they want right away. I think that's very difficult uh, because when you get it out there, it's very <laughs> it becomes wobbly and uh, it is difficult to control. And as you probably already know, if you've been throwing, it's very difficult to get it in again. It's easy to get it out. So I usually start out with something that is a little more straight up, maybe a little bit of angle out, but not too much because I can always make it wider. And I always try and keep the rim compressed and very strong, and very thick. So this first pull is not actually a pull, but more like I'm pushing the clay in a little bit. So I wouldn't even call that a pull. <laughs> Just push. <laughs> Another thing you've just got to keep in mind is that, of course, you need to apply a lot of pressure down here at the bottom. But take your time, let it sink in until you feel that now you have grabbed all the clay and um, it's even all the way around. And then move up slowly. And I'm going to leave a lot of clay up here at the rim. Um, first of all, because we're going to expand it, and if it's not thick enough now, it's going to be super thin when we expand it. And also, for a sink, I actually want the final um, the final uh, sink to have a, quite a, a, of a thick rim. I may even turn it down a little bit, and I need, I need clay for that. So, again, I'm going to take, I think it take a little bit more down here. Bubbles are not such a big problem, but it's it's good if you can if you can detect them early on and get the air out of it. That's so again. I'm just gonna empty the inside. I don't want. I mean, I used a lot of water when I was expanding it, um, but I don't want the water to sit there for too long. It's okay to have water on the surface, but if it sits there too long, it starts to soak into the clay and it will just weaken it. Um, and it will take forever to dry. So. Um, as I go, I remove it, and then if if it's not slippery enough, I can always add some um, some slip or a little bit of water on the surface. Um, I just don't want the, the entire clay ball to um, to be weakened by uh, by the water. So now I'm just trying to even out the wall. I'm pulling it a little bit, but. Getting closer, and I think at this point it's probably what is it 30 35 centimeters or something. I would like it to be maybe 10 centimeters more, and uh, I will expand on both sides, <laughs> of course. So I need to expand about five centimeters to, to reach that goal. So let's see. If we can get a little bit more out of the bottom, it's probably going to be my last button pull. So, making sure that my rim is straight. Relatively, <laughs> I mean, when you get to this size, I don't know, it's never a hundred percent, but it's close enough. I think it's okay. 
What do you think? <laughs> if you think I'm doing something completely wrong, please tell me. <laughs> So, let me see what we got out of that last. Yeah, now it's 40. So, maybe another five centimeters. So, but for now, I'm just gonna, um, gonna use my rib to uh, perfect the, the, the curve inside. And there are two ways you can do this. Um, and I'm using randomly both of them. When you go the, the way, if you're right-handed, like I am, there you are. If you're right-handed like I am, uh, and you turn the, the, the wheel anti-clock, to do this, you need to use your left hand. Luckily for me, I'm almost equally good with my left hand, so I can do that. The other solution is that you switch it, so you turn the other way around, because then you can use your right hand on this side. Of course, using it here would, um, would jump around. That wouldn't work. So let me just try with, um, with my left hand. And I'm just supporting it here on the outside, and down at the bottom, you can apply a lot of pressure because there's uh, snowballs to fall down. And then as you get up the sides, you need to ease up and not apply so much pressure. And don't go too fast. So this way we got it a lot more smooth on the inside. One of the tricky parts about doing a white shallow bowl, or any kind of bowl for that matter, is uh, what is most often referred to as, I think, beginner's shoulder. So we have a nice curve in the beginning, but then it kind of goes out a little bit and then it continues. And that shoulder just doesn't look good. And especially for sink, you need a continuous flow. Now, if you do get a little bit of that, don't worry too much, because with a white, thick, a bowl like this, you can easily trim it on the inside. Even though I know lots of putters tell you not to do that, I don't care. If it works, it works. But I think in my case, I actually got around and got it really nice. So I'm just gonna wet it a little bit here because I still wanna expand it just a little bit. Still some dry areas, especially when you get to this size. It's really tricky if there's any dry areas and your fingers get stuck. You can really pull it out of shape. Um, so I don't want that. On the other hand, I don't want it to be soaking wet. So just, just slippery enough for me to do whatever I need to do. And now I'm babbling because I'm really focused on getting this right. So um, excuse me if my uh, Maybe I should just not talk. <laughs> so let's check the size again. It's now 42. And I think, I think maybe, oh, I got a little bit of dirt there. I think maybe I can, I can expand it just a little bit. Sometimes with big uh, vessels you need to move out to see it, but you can see it's it's going a little more straight up here. I think I can expand it here and here also. So uh, I'm thinking I'm going to start out with the, the rib down here. Yeah. yeah, that looks better. The inside is now so beautiful. This is one of the many benefits of this clay is that it is so super strong. And of course that is due to the high amount of, of grok. So I can I can I can do things with this. I can lay it out in, in, in ways that would not work in, in most of the clays. There's a I mean if you try to do something like this with a softer non-grok clay, it's a very high risk that it's gonna collapse on you. I have tried that a few times. <laughs> So now uh, I'm actually gonna let it rest for a little bit because uh, it's um, it's almost at the shape and size that I want, but I wanna do the final shaping and for that I need to dry up just a little bit. And I'm gonna let it spin as I do this because um, I wanted to, even though there's no drag in here, there's no 
open windows or anything, there's still a risk that uh, if you just leave it, that it won't uh, dry uh, evenly. And uh, of course we want that because if it doesn't dry evenly um, and you end up with some areas that are a little more dry than, than others, then it will, um, it will go out of shape. Just gonna let it spin here, maybe, I don't know, for an hour or two, something. Get some lunch and um, then I will um, get back and do the final touch on this. So now it had some time to stiffen up and um, it's a lot more stable now. So I can do the last uh, part of the shaping. I just want to perfect something on the inside and I want to finish um, the rim. So I'm just going to start with the inside. So now I can get away with um, applying more, more pressure um, without any risk of it um, collapsing. I'm not so concerned with the very inner part because I'm going to cut that away anyway for the drainage I have it here. And um, so in the end, that will be cut away. Sometimes it's difficult to see if the curve is right and you need to like take your fingers and feel it and uh, it doesn't feel bad. It actually feels pretty good. And um, if there's anything, any little uh, inconsistencies in the, in the um, if there's anything in the curve uh, that's not perfect, um, then when it gets to um, leather heart, as I mentioned, I can uh, I can easily um, I can easily adjust it a little bit. And that looks good. It's, I like this um, like really strong um, look on the edge of a sink like this. It's always a question of when to stop. And uh, more than one time I destroyed the part because I didn't stop in time. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think this looks good. I will do the last fine tuning um, when, it's, um, when it's leather hard. So let's see how big it got now. It's a lot of little crumbles here. I don't want that on, on the pot. Let's see, yeah, it's now 45, 46 centimeters. So that's a pretty wide sink. So I'm just gonna leave it here for now. Just let it spin very, very slowly so it dries evenly. Now the sink is uh, leather hard, very stable because it is <clears throat> very thick <laughs> walls. I need that for a sink. So now it's time to first cut out the hole for the drainage. And that needs, of course, to be a little bit bigger than uh, what I need for, um, because it's going to shrink. <laughs> and also, I have this, uh, uh, I don't know what you call this, top of it. Um, so I need a hole that's a little bit bigger, and then I need uh, an indent for, for, for this, because you want it to be below the end of the curve on the, on, the, uh, on the sink, because you don't want the water to stop there. If this was just sitting on top, like this, the water would stop here. So we need that to be uh, pushed down a little bit. I've done that a few times, and it's actually not too difficult. I'm going to start out with this uh, tool, because it's about half the size of um, my drainage. So I'm going to use that to mark up. Um, the difficult part about this is, of course, I can't, you know, I don't have anything to lean on. And normally I would like to have something for my um, body. This is really just to mark it up. And I will check, oh, I'll check with my, my drainage here. This is exactly the size. So I need to cut it a little bit bigger than that. And um, for that, I have a small uh, loop tool that I'm gonna use. I'm gonna take 
play out as we go. So this um, is actually a little bit thicker than uh, the last ones I made. This is a little more than a centimeter, which I think is, is perfect. It's more perfect than uh, the first ones I made because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of pressure um, on this when you um, when you screw on the the, the the drainage. So I want it to be very solid. And now when I shake it, it's maybe. I don't know, three, four millimeters bigger, but it's gonna shrink, so it's gonna be smaller. And besides, it's okay if there's a little bit of wriggling because there's plenty of, um, of space to, to tighten it. So, so I think that should be good. So um, the next step is to, um, to do that, I don't know what you call it, a flange or something? No, that's not really the word, but I need to make this indent. So this disappears into the sink. Yeah, I think this one is good because you see, I want something that's a little bit bigger than this. So I think this is gonna be good. Just gonna soften it a little bit. And also gonna round all the corners. In general, sharp corners tend to chip off much easier than rounded corners. So it's rounded corners are stronger. I think this is good. Yeah, I think that's gonna be good. So that's it. And um, secondly, I wanna check if the curve here is perfect. I could trim it, but in this case, I actually threw it <laughs> perfect. It, it feels completely perfect. So. All I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna um, use my metal whip and just uh, go over it very lightly. Just to make sure that there's no unevenness. It can be really difficult to see if the curve is perfect. So that's why I'm also using my hands because it's, it's much easier to feel it. I mean, normally for a bowl, I wouldn't care so much. I mean, if it looks fine, it looks fine. But for a sink where the water has to flow uh, without anything stopping it, it's very important, I think, <laughs> that um, it's very even. Now we're ready to um, apply the slip and um, just gonna just gonna mix it up uh, it always settles a little bit so but it's not bad I mean it's pure clay so there's no um, there's no <laughs> stone material or anything that can settle in the bottom it's pure clay and water so it's usually not very bad um, usually for a bowl like this when adding the slip I'll just throw it in there and, and take it around. But <laughs> since I have a hole down there, I'm not sure that uh, I can do that. So I think I'm just gonna, gonna use the brush here and, and add it gradually. And the reason I'm giving in this um, porcelain slip is that um, I want to um, I want to have a, a white canvas to work on. Um, I mean, the glazes I have also look good on this clay, but um, when you have a white uh, surface, um, it's um, the colors uh, just come out stronger. So um, that's why I'm doing it. And also <laughs> to show you that it is indeed possible. 
I hope, <laughs> to add porcelain to stoneware, which is the purpose of this exercise. I'm not too concerned if I get a little bit over the edge because it's very easy to remove. I can scrape it off um, either now um, or when it's um, when it's dry. That's no problem at all. I think that looks pretty good. There's one place here where there's a little bit of a bubble. So I think that's fine. Now I just need to uh, let it dry. Um, so much <laughs> that I can turn it around and trim on the back side um, without destroying the, the, the porcelain slip that I put on now. But I'm going to turn it around on a much bigger bed. I have uh, 50 in, uh, centimeter beds that I made. Um, I think I'm probably going to put uh, some uh, paper or something, you know, just to protect it a little bit. But um, for now, I'm just going to let it um, dry a little bit more. Now it had time to um, dry a little bit more. It's still sort of leather hard, perfect for trimming. So I turned it around on this uh, very wide bed and um, just gonna do a little bit of trimming. Not so much, just gonna even out the, the walls and perfect the, the foot. I don't want the foot to be too narrow. Remember, it have to um, to sit on <laughs> on the table in the in the bathroom, very solid. Um, it's a little bit messy when you trim like this, <laughs> because of course I had to remove um, the splash pan, um, but that's fine. And as always. This, uh, remember, I want it to be glazed on the outside and look like it's glazed all the way down to the bottom. But if you glaze all the way down here and your glaze runs even a millimeter, it will stick to your uh, shelves. So what I do is this visual trick that I talked a lot about. I, I cut a bevel here at 45 degrees, just five millimeters something. So that way I will only actually glaze to, uh, to the start of this. So it's like... Uh, five millimeter before the bottom. But because of the of the beveled etched, uh, when you look at it, it looks like the glaze goes all the way down. It's a little bit of a visual trick, but it works really well. Just something like this. That should be enough. Now I just turn it around. I put it on a plaster bed so it can uh, soak out some of the moist uh, in the foot. So it will sort of hopefully um, dry evenly. I'm also going to cover it uh, with a piece of, uh, of newspaper and some plastic because uh, for this uh, big and white uh, sort of a pot, um, I want it to dry slowly. Good morning. Now it's time to unload the kiln with the next glaze. It's interesting. Will it stick? <laughs> Will it flake off? You know, because of that shrinkage difference between the porcelain and the uh, stoneware, it theoretically shouldn't work, but I'm pretty sure it will. I always say this, <laughs> but I will repeat it again. Please wait until the kiln is cool enough to open it. It's now about 50 degrees, which is fine because I can actually handle the pots and there's no risk of any damage to the pots or damage to the kiln. Because if you open it too early, it can, it can damage the pot. And especially if it's glazing, it can change the glazing. And the kiln don't like to be opened that early. The heating elements don't like the thermal shock of opening it if it's too warm. And besides, you can't handle the pots when it's too Warm anyway, so please wait. I know I'm not a very patient man, and you probably feel the same. You just want to see how it turned out, but wait. So I already actually opened this kiln because I had some other pots in the top um, that I removed. They turned out fine, so I'm optimistic <laughs> about the next layers. So uh, let's go and take a look. 
Yeah. That looks good. As you can see, the porcelain didn't flake off. It didn't crack, which is sort of strange in a way, <laughs> because the shrinkage rate on the porcelain is about 20%, and the stoneware is about 10 and it still worked out. But let's take a look, a closer look at this one and the ones we have below, the bowl and the sinks. I really do like how this turned out, and it's not super light, but it is light and nice, nice foot, deep foot. And uh, this clay is one of my favorites. It, uh, it looks almost black here, but more dark gray. But uh, once it's uh, glazed by it, it will be almost completely black. It's really, really beautiful. Now I just have to figure out what glaze I want to give it. I mean, maybe I should just give it a clear glaze. I don't know. What do you think? Or maybe I should give it something that sort of shine through and show the difference between the, the dark, deeper areas and the white uh, top. Anyway, I'm happy and the experiment succeeded, which was the most important part of this, uh, this, this um, test. The porcelain works on top of the stoneware. That's pretty amazing in a way. So let's take a look at the next layer. This next one is pretty interesting because I put, as you remember, a much thicker layer of porcelain here to get this sort of uh, 3D impression on it. And so I would have assumed that <laughs> the risk of it uh, crackling or, you know, uh, showing some, some difference in shrinkage would be more visible, but it isn't. It's perfect, <laughs> which theoretically is, yeah, I don't know. It works. <laughs> and uh, again, this is also the black clay. And this one I trimmed down so it's actually super light. Um, it's a very nice bowl. You can hear the sound. It's always a good sign. If there was any, any cracks, serious cracks, it wouldn't have this sound. So I like this. And similar to the other one, I have to figure out whether I just want to give it a clear glaze or maybe an opaque glaze that will show the difference between the porcelain and, um, and the black clay. So, I like how this one turned out. And now for the last one, the big sink. See, this is interesting because again, the primary goal of having the uh, porcelain stick to the clay worked. There's no crackles, there's no nothing that didn't turn out well. There is, oh, I think I hit the mic there. There's a bit of a shine through of the, of the dark clay or the red clay. There's a little bit of dust on the surface, which is sort of a little bit of a mystery to me how it got up there, but I can, I can brush it off, I can wash it off. It's still a much lighter surface than of course the other side of it. It's also got some dust here. I can clean that, but it's nice. It didn't warp. <laughs> it's still circular, and um, and and the surface is perfect. So I would say I'm just going to put this aside because it's still a little bit warm. It was deepest in the kiln. <laughs> so all in all, I would say this was a success. Applying porcelain to stoneware is possible, despite the fact that the shrinkage rate is so different. I think it turned out interesting and there's a lot more of course you can do with this. I hope you enjoyed this uh, video and uh, if you did, uh, please subscribe, share, write a comment if you have any comments, good or bad, all welcome. Um, and I hope to see you soon again. Uh, next Saturday I'm going to have another video uh, live around 5 p.m. Central European time. So um, please come back and excuse me if it's a few minutes late. I hope to see you soon again. Have a great day. <laughs>